active duty service members, veterans, family members, thank you for your service. And thank you for listening to Return to Roots Mildevet Resource Podcast, where we document our shared experiences, stories, and transitioning and reintegrating from the military to the community. Hosted by two transitioning service members, myself, Chris Elder, and my partner in crime, Jonathan Hernandez. For more information, go to mill2vet.com. If you have little ears, ensure you listen to the content before you allow them to listen. And if you are in crisis and homelessness, suicide ideations, or incarceration, dial 211, Courage to Call for assistance. Now, stand by for the sound of freedom. Return to Roots. Today, we welcome back our one and only Amy Claggett. She is here to talk about some veteran updates, also about the new upcoming deadline for the Presumptive Act that just passed. So without further ado, welcome, Amy. We have dearly missed you. If we know you're traveling all over the universe and back, trying to figure out for our listeners a lot of new information, hence why we are bringing you back now today, and we're going to start a series of different events uh, for different programs that the VA does. So welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be back. Very glad to be back. So tell us, what, what have you uh, been up to the last uh, few months that, uh, that we've been on here? A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of big changes have happened. Oh, uh, what have I been up to? No good to start now. <laughs> um, so um, I, got, well, I guess the biggest thing, I got invited to um, uh, for research, uh, a focus group. Um, that turns out is independently being funded. I was invited to a focus group um, for women veterans uh, to uh, improve uh, VA healthcare for women vets specifically that are in rural areas. Um, I was part of the first focus group that they did. Uh, because it's being independently <clears throat> funded outside the VA, they're going to get a chance to put all this information together and present it to VA leadership. Um, from that, from that, um, I actually got I got asked to help. Um, talk to other women vets that aren't using the VA and also be a peer leader in some of the other focus groups that they're going to do over the same thing to try to narrow down some of the issues and improve. So when was that? Uh, that was actually last week. I did that focus group. Yep. Yeah. And I, I, I'm in constant contact with the leaders now. Um, I actually gave them all the links to Mel to Vet, Return to Roots, um, and told them, and I told all the other women that were in the group, I was like, hey, this is, this is great. This is a good startup. This is all over the place. You know, it's not just in one area. It's trying to pull all these resources. These guys are doing it. It's, it's an amazing thing. Um, I put my contact information out there as well, so I can invite them. Uh, to the Facebook group, but I did give them the links and everything like that. So uh, I, I need to find more women veterans um, that want to be part of this, want to be part of the focus group and talking about it. Um, while they are dealing with women veterans, um, I think that improving for everyone not just women vets is paramount. So I like to bring up issues in those that are plaguing all vets, not just women vets. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the issues specifically that I brought up 
was that the VA <clears throat> has a tendency to do all these great innovations, you know, like they took all the travel claims that, you know, you can do for your medical and um, they said, you know, we're going to go online with this. This is going to be great. You just have to scan your stuff. You no longer have to do it at the kiosks in the health centers. You, you know, you no longer. And, you know, I was like, well, that's a great innovation. And that's great. You have this huge generation of veterans, the Vietnam vets specifically, that may or may not have the technology to do that. You're talking about rural vets. So they may or may not have internet. It depends on where they are, where they're located, because internet is still a luxury. It's not a utility. Um, <clears throat> or, you know, and, or you may have people that just don't, they don't have printers, they don't have scanners. So while this innovation is really great and it's good to go in this direction, realize that not everybody still has this. We need to leave older systems in place for either people that don't know how to use the technology or, you know, for whatever the reason is. You know, until everybody has internet, until everybody has access to stuff like that. You know, your programs are just not going to do, you know, what they did because either if you leave both programs, then you're inclusive of everybody. If you don't leave two, <clears throat> both programs, then what does that leave you? That leaves you with groups that maybe can't be included because they just don't have the resources to do it. So what, what more to some, come. What were some of the other um, things that you guys were focusing on during that, that group? Uh, so uh, in the past few years, um, care and access for women vets has, has gone up. They've created uh, women's health centers. Um, not every VA has one, but a lot of them do now. They have women's program managers. They also have program managers for minority groups. Um, those program managers can be contacted to cut through a lot of red tape. So you're not just going to a patient advocate and hoping that you are heard. Um, <clears throat> they also have, uh, specially trained doctors. So if you've been a victim of an assault, a sexual assault, uh, you can actually request, you know, uh, you want all male doctors or you want all female doctors or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, for women, um, they no longer, so when I started going to the VA in 2008, um, <clears throat> I had to get, essentially I had to get permission to get a mammogram or get an annual pap smear. It wasn't just something that was, I could just schedule on my own. That has now changed uh, where I don't have to get permission to have that. I can just, I can schedule those things without going through my primary care. Um, the exception is you have to go through primary care if you don't live close enough to a facility and you need to go to, uh, you need to go out in town. So then your primary care would put it in. But the red tape is no longer there. Um, they offer now maternity care for women. They never used to do that. Um, they offer fertility treatments. You know, the maternity care, that's a, that's a really big one. Um, yeah. I know from my personal experience, I've had sailors that weren't very high performers and they were actually getting borderline NJP. And sometimes, you know, NJP, one of the factors that we're looking at is I got the sailor that's about to give birth and said sailor may have done something like really bad and we need to kick this sailor out but the said sailor is pregnant which is looked at as a medical uh condition so right. the va creating that program that will actually ensure that the the care is actually provided afterwards is going to be really big um and i'm not saying like we want to kick uh, right. No, no, I see what you're saying. Out, but I'm telling you, it happens quite quite often. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen exactly what I'm talking about. But that is a factor that, that goes into decision making whenever it comes to uh, asking someone to leave the military to, to non-judicial punishment. And right. it's not really an ask. They're, they're kicked 
they're kicked out. But that that is that's that is a consideration. So that I know that that's going to be um, um, an actual ability for them to get care through VA. That's that's really big. That's awesome. Yeah. No. Yeah. The the maternity care and I mean they even they they can uh, you know if you if for a woman if you want to breastfeed um, they offer now you can get breast pumps um, you get. Um, you know, and other things the VA has done, I mean, after the opiate crisis, um, where they figured out the VA was the biggest offender of this, of course, you've got all these vets coming in and they're always in pain, right? So what were they doing? They were prescribing pills. So with the opiate crisis coming, I mean, there was a, there was a gap there where they just cut everybody off and they said no more pain pills. Um, but now have since gone and said, you know what, we'll, we'll, we'll do massage. We'll, we'll get people TENS units. We'll, um, you know, and that is not specific to women. That's, you know, that's for everybody. Um, you know, we'll do uh, acupuncture. You know, they'll send you for that. Um, it, it might be available at the VA facility, but if not, you can get it through community care. Um, you know, so more options than just deal with it. So being there uh, at this group, what was like, what was the, what was the coolest exp uh, part of this experience? Cause you said it was a, is it a third party that funded this? So, mm -hmm. okay, so yeah. it must've been so, a pretty good experience. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was. And the other women that were, the other women that were on the call, uh, I mean, if a, a few of them didn't know the VA very well, but um, there were uh, a couple that that knew it very well, um, and it wasn't a completely so it wasn't a complaining call. It wasn't. They're really looking for solutions to improve healthcare. Uh, I mean, they're specifically looking at rural uh, women vets, but I think they're going for an overall change. Because if you change for that, then you've got to change for, you know, you've got to change for everybody. So um, <clears throat> that was the positive of it. Um, I, the other positive was that they, for me, at least personally, that they were like, wow, you know, you, you know, like I answered a couple of the girls' questions on the call. I was like, oh no, you're doing that wrong. You need to just, you know, do this, that, or the other thing. Um, so it was positive all the way around in that aspect. Just, it wasn't just all about the bad stuff the VA does. I think they do do good and they do have positive things. I think people get very frustrated with them. So, and I think it's just a lack of understanding on a lot of parts. It could be the vet, it could be the person they're dealing with at the VA, but that creates, I think, friction. And then that leads to, you know, possibly anger, but huh, I guess it's all on what you do with the anger, right? How'd you, uh, how'd you get involved? And becoming part of this focus group. So, how did the how did the third party find you? Oh, so it was it was through the VA. I got a I got a note saying that hey, this this focus group was going to be going on. It's just being kind of tied into the system. So I get um, things from the VA itself that says hey, this is going on or that's going on. Um, like a few of the things I've posted on the Facebook page for you guys, it's like stuff that has come to me through, you know, email from va.gov or from my, um, from my VA healthcare. <clears throat> and I, you know, I don't just trash it. I always read it and see what's up. Sometimes there's stuff in there. Sometimes there's not. This was one thing I was like, oh, well, I'm a rural vet. So, and I'm a female, so I'll, I'll put in for this. I don't know what it's about, but we'll see. And <clears throat> So that's where it landed me with all of that i will i know you were very excited to talk about today about the pack act can you talk to our um guys our listeners 
guys mm-hmm. and gals and whatever they identify themselves at and share with us what is the pack that and is there an urgency to talk about it what's going on with that So the PAC Act um, expanded benefits surrounding presumptive conditions. Um, So it expanded it. It added about 20 different presumptive conditions um, between Agent Orange and the Gulf Wars. Um, And it also now it required the VA healthcare centers to do toxic health screenings. In other words, were you exposed to any of this? So if you're going into the VA and you're getting a checkup within the VA, they're supposed to be asking you, have you been exposed to any, you know, toxins like burn pits or an incinerator or Agent Orange or whatever? Um, no, I know I was asked when I was doing my claim about yeah. stuff too. Yeah, and you should have been. Um, so, you know, it, it greatly expanded it. Um, so I guess first, uh, a lot of people get confused about what uh, a presumptive issue is. So um, a presumptive issue is when the VA is going to automatically presume that that disability was due to your military service. So when you're putting in a claim for compensation, the burden of proof generally is with the vet and their doctors to say that your knee hurts, let's just say, we'll just use that, or we'll use low back, your low back hurts because of your military service. With a presumptive condition, all you need to do is prove that you were in a place at a certain time and that you've been diagnosed with a condition. It's already going to be approved as this was caused by your military service. So let's, um, there is one condition that applies to all veterans, doesn't matter when they serve, where they serve, what happened to them. It doesn't make any difference. If you served 90 continuous days in service and you at any point in time in your life are diagnosed with ALS, it is service connected. Now, I don't know why, but those are the rules. Um, I've never looked any further. I don't, why ALS would, I, I don't know anybody that would want that. So that is the one condition. <laughs> that if you are diagnosed with it, it is service connected. Um, Your first 365 days out of service. If you are diagnosed with any condition, it can be assumed to be related to military service in that first 365 days. Doesn't mean that it will, doesn't mean they'll approve it, It just means that within that 365 days, you can go in and say, okay, I got diagnosed with arthritis. Let's just say, we use that as an example. So I got diagnosed with arthritis. The VA can actually say, okay, that was within your first 365 days of being out. We can assume that this is related to military service. So that is also another way that you can do presumptive. So with the PAC Act and it adding to it, um, as of right now, if you, there's no time limit per se on the PAC Act as far as filing or doing this, that, or the other thing. Um, But if you file an intent to file, which is form, I did write it down. 21-0966 21-0966 is an intent to file. And anybody that files for benefits, you have to file an intent to file. So if you get that intent to file on file before August 9th of 2023, 
and you are successful in your case um, and they award you, then they'll backdate it to August 10th of 2022. Um, so that is the rush currently. You don't have to have the full claim in, but you want to get your intent to file in. So did you catch all that? Okay. <laughs> Um, and I mean, for the record, if you, if you put an intent to file in on, let's say August 11th of this year, I mean, you've missed the deadline to get back paid to then, but then let's say you wait, um, until next year to actually file the claim, but you do it before August 11th of 2024, then they have to back pay. So an intent to file is good for a year. So once you put that down, but then let's say you wait to file the other stuff, then, I mean, you're still gonna get a year, but that's kind of the rush with the PAC Act right now is just to get that intent to file on that you wanna file for these things. So, um, is there anything else about presumptive that we'd like to know? So presumptive, essentially just straight line allows people to say, hey, I developed this because I was in country and they're going to immediately tie it to that. And what's the what's the deadline to, to get these done? Is there a deadline for this? So there is no deadline. It's just um, if you want to get back paid uh, all the way to August 10th of 20, August 10th of 2022, then you want to put in an intent to file before August 9th of this year. So you don't have to have your whole claim together. You don't have to have all the documents, but just put the intent to file in and then you can get back paid for a year instead of having to wait a year. Have they, has the VA to your knowledge, I don't think they've ever done anything like this before. No, not like this. Not with back pay going back a year after just putting in an intent to file, no. They haven't. Um, yeah, they, I mean, it, the PAC Act also expanded like for the Vietnam vets, it expanded areas um, that were exposed during that time. So it did open up a window and it also added some more presumptive issues to exposure to Agent Orange. So, but the big one was the Gulf War vets and being deployed to the Gulf. So um, they weren't just saying, hey, put it in, you know, maybe it might get linked, maybe it won't. They finally concreted it and said, yep, nope. If you have, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome, if you have fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, um, and even for Gulf War vets, um, <clears throat> undiagnosed stuff like fatigue, skin symptoms, headaches, muscle pain, joint pain, uh, neurological, you know, sleep disturbances, gastrointestinal symptoms, cardiovascular symptoms, weight loss, menstrual disorders, um, you know, any of that, you know, you can even put in and, and we'll be service connected as long as you can prove that in during service you deployed over there. So. That's a, uh... That's a pretty big win for the veteran community. Now, it is. I, I imagine back to our conversation, you know, people in rural areas that may not be paying attention to this could be missing out on they could be for their their health to get better and also to receive uh, care. So, mm -hmm. uh, what's your message to them? Um. You know, I guess get get plugged in. I I would say as far as sign up at your VA healthcare center for the newsletters. You know, um, get in. You know, ask your primary care for um, <clears throat> for community care so you can get out in the community. Um, you know, if you can make it, start going to some of these groups like VFW, DAV. Um, Navy Marine Corps League. I mean, you know, w w whatever you can, if, even if you can only get there 
you know, once every couple of months. Um, you know, if you don't have an email, sign up for an email. Um, and that's, that's how you do it. So for the listeners that are still active duty right now, what can mm -hmm. they do to prepare themselves to be savvy about what needs to happen? Because even just talking to you, everything that I thought I knew about the VA and the process and the claim has basically changed. So it's now hearsay versus reality, right? So what would you tell them and why, why is it important to stay connected? So you know what's going on because the VA, just like anything else, is 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 changing. You know, they're they're updating, you know, they they've been slowly updating their schedule of ratings, how they how they determine service connection, how you get rated, you know, the PAC Act being signed, of course, that changes things for presumptive issues. Um and you've got to you've got to know yourself. You're going to know what you're going to claim. Um, I always tell vets, you know, a year out, you, you, a year out, you, you need to, if you haven't done it, you need to go to medical. You need to get things documented. Stop putting it off. Stop thinking that everybody's just going to think you're a sick bay commando. Get documentation on this stuff. Do it at least, you know, start at least a year out. If you can start earlier than that, great. Some people can't. Um, even a year is hard for some people, just depending on their command, where they're at or what they're doing. Um, but put your, you know, put yourself first in this instance and, you know, get that documentation and, and get out there. Um, you know, go to va.gov, start reading up on, you know, the sites, look at, um, you know, the militarytimes.com. I mean, they put stuff out there about the VA. Um, you know, go join the DAV, sign up for their newsletters. DAV is huge in Washington. They're real big advocates. They, they get in there, they fight for the legislation and, you know, they're doing that. So even if you're not going to the groups, you're getting the newsletters. So you kind of see stuff that's going on and you might not get it all, but, you know, heck, join your website. <laughs> you know, I mean. There's, there's, you know, there's updates there. There's updates going on, um, you know, and I, I've kind of, you know, you know, been all over the place, but, you know, I'm going to start putting more stuff up on your guys' website, you know, as I see it for the VA and, you know, what's going on that way, more people, more people see it, um, you know, on Facebook myself, I mean, I'm in a women's veterans group, a couple of them, I'm in, a veterans group. I'm in. Um, I'm in a group for VA vetted, which is just for <clears throat> VA loan users for buying their homes, um, which you know teaches you about that. I'm in. Uh, you, you know the uh, some of the veterans groups I'm in. You know there. I mean, there's vets from all over the country, and they're in the group. And while some of them, yes, are dying all the time, there is wisdom to be gained. <laughs> from some of it, you know, and you learn like, oh, that vet, they, they're they using, you know, the Phoenix, Arizona, you know, VA system. And then you kind of learn about that. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, I know we're going to do a later episode on like VA state benefits, but, um, you know, I'm good with Virginia, uh, Texas, New Mexico, Las Vegas, Louisiana, um, those are the states that I'm real good with. And it's either because I worked with somebody that lived there or I live there myself. Um, so, you know, I looked up the, you know, specifically. Um, I know a little bit about uh, Illinois as well, but not enough to, you know, I'd have to look up the state itself to really get all the benefits. Um, and let me ask you something about that right now. So you're sure. you're saying there's more to the VA than just 
the VA itself, right? So it's also broken down by states. And, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of diff different benefits that are at the national level, kind of like a chain of command, right? So there's the basic right. or at a national level. And then from there, they get broken down into different categories that each state decides to support or not support, correct? Right, yes. Yeah. Perfect. And the, the, the VA in and of itself, okay? So there are actually two components to the VA. So there's the healthcare side, which is its own entity. All right. So for instance, if, so I change, I change, I changed my last name. Right. So, um, I mean, I, I did it like last year, but I changed my last name. So the VA healthcare side, I had to call that side and I had to change my name with that. The benefits side of the house, I also had to call and update my name. So I couldn't just call one place. I had to call two and because the two of them don't really talk to each other. <laughs> they don't, they don't. The left hand has no idea what the right hand is doing. I'm serious. So, you know, it, it's the benefits side and the benefits side is disability benefits, pension and survivor benefits, um, your GI, uh, your education, um, your housing, your home loans, um, burial benefits, um, voc rehab, uh, you know, it, I mean, that's all that. And then you've got your healthcare side. And most people don't even realize that. So if you have to change something like you got to change your address, you, you, you have to change it with both. You can't just change it with one and hope that it translates because it, it usually, nope. <laughs> nope. Well, that's interesting. That's something that a lot of us really don't know. Yeah. I like when you get your disability rating and you go register at the VA, all right? So there are certain benefits in healthcare that you get if you have a certain rating, right? So if your rating is, and I, I think I posted something in the uh, Return to Roots uh, Facebook page about the different percentages and kind of a breakdown of what you get depending on what percent percentage you have. Um, but so 0%, if you are 0%, you're not going to get any money. But as far as the healthcare goes, then that problem, let's say you, you, you have service connection for your low back and you have service connection for your right knee. And I don't, you know, and then you have like migraines or something. I don't know. Just trying to look at things off the top of my head. But Are you everybody have, all my all my things. Come on. I know, I know, right? No. Uh, but you have zero percent for those items. So you're not getting any money. And you know, obviously you can't put your children on, but you can go to the VA healthcare and get treatment for those issues. They have to cover that if it's service connected. So even if it's zero service connected. Here's another fun fact. Yeah. The VA has a clothing allowance. Did anybody know that? Doesn't look that's, like it. That's pretty, that's pretty <laughs> crazy. That's, that, like, so the VA is more than just yeah. care, which, yeah. which we've been learning um, through our transition and reintegrating into the community we've been learning these things but a lot of active duty uh didn't know this and yeah. a lot of people that separate don't even know because they literally just cut ties and run off into the wind and yep. realize that yeah. they're leaving services on the table uh, yeah. a lot of people they raise their right hand you know and swear an oath and part of that oath is on the countryside too and they're they're going to take care of you for the rest of your life for serving that's part of it and yep. if you don't utilize those va benefits well guess what you're just letting the government get off on their contract right lincoln's promise to us all um 
but no, uh, on the healthcare side, they do have a clothing allowance. So if you have a prosthetic, if you are in a wheelchair, if you, um, and it, of course, it needs to be service connected. So just throw that out there, but it could be 0%. You don't even need to get anything for it. So as long as it's 0%, as long as it's service connected, they have to take care of it. Um, if you have a skin condition and you use a topical ointment that erodes clothes, you can get a clothing allowance. So, I, you know, and it's, you have to apply for it every year, but let's say you have a prosthetic and you have a skin condition and they're both service connected. Well, then you can apply for two clothing allowances for the same year. So, um, Yes, and there's so much. Um, so we covered service connection. That at 30%, if you are overall 30% service connected, at that point you can claim dependence. So your kids, your wife, your husband, your spouse, whatever. Um, if both of you are retired, on your VA claim, or both of you have separated from military service and both of you have over 30% uh, service connected disability, then you both can claim the kids and you can claim each other and it's legal to do that. Uh, so not just one of you is getting paid, both of you get paid for that uh, up until the child reaches 18 years old. At that point, it's a different story. Only one can claim. And you can only keep claiming that child if they are still in school. So let's say they don't graduate high school until they're like 18 and a half or they're 19, depending on the birthday, right? So they'll drop off the claim, but as long as you call the dependents hotline, they'll add them right back on. Um, and you can keep them on up until 22. So if they go on to full-time college, then you can keep them on the claim at that point too. Most people don't know that. So. Um, any questions you guys have? I think we covered a lot today uh, with all of this. We covered the PAC, the presumptive conditions. Are there more or do they continuously change? And if so, where can we go find that information? So va.gov is where you can actually find the information. Um, they have a list and you basically just search presumptive conditions and it comes up. There are a lot of other presumptive conditions. Um, let's see. I mean, I can go through some of them if you want. I've got it pulled up, so. Yeah. All so right. for our listeners, I want to do it real quick. We're gonna share a screen so that everybody can see how easy it is. Yep. Oh, let's go to. Uh, boom, boom. Share a screen. So we are going to go to va.gov. And then from here, we are searching presumptive condition fact sheet, correct? Yep, I should bring it up. Boom. And then from here, where do we go? That's a lot of stuff. Hmm. U.S. De uh, Department of Veteran Affairs presumptive disability Boom. benefits. And then there, there you, you go. go. That's awesome. I'll let you talk about it now. So, all right, going down, we'll just start at the top because I'm actually looking at that thing that you just pulled up. All right, so I already talked about the ALS. 
uh, former prisoners of war. So if you're a former prisoner of war um, and you have a condition that is at least 10% disabling, you may have presumptive condition. Uh, whether or not a specific condition is presumed depends on the length of imprisonment. Uh, if you were in prison for any length of time, specific presumed conditions include psychosis, any of the anxiety states, dysmatic disorder or depressive neuroses, uh, organic residuals of frostbite, post-traumatic osteoarthritis, heart disease, or hypertensive, uh, hypertensive vascular disease, stroke and residual effects, osteoporosis uh, when the veteran has post-traumatic stress disorder. If you are in prison for at least 30 days, um, so there's a heart disease, chronic dysentery, um, others include, I mean, there's a huge list, but um, osteoporosis, avitromosis, which is a vitamin deficiency of any vitamin, doesn't matter what it is, uh, cirrhosis of the liver, peripheral uh, neuropathy, peptic ulcer disease, irritable bowel syndrome. I mean, it, it goes on. A uh, big one for the Vietnam vets. Um, and for the record, these are updated. All right, so like the PAC Act, this that added more things to this. Um, I've seen just one time the, the secretary of the VA actually come out and say, this stuff is gonna be considered presumptive. I've seen that happen once without Congress. It was kind of a miracle. And it was actually with dealing with the burn pits where they came out and they said, sinusitis and chronic rhinitis would be considered presumptive for um, the Gulf War vets. Um, so some of the big ones with the Vietnam vets, um, B cell leukemia, type two diabetes, ischemic heart disease, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Parkinson's, uh, prostate cancer, any kind of respiratory cancer, bladder cancer. Um, so a lot of different cancers. <clears throat> So they have a couple of things that if they be if it, if it becomes with their rating scale, if it becomes greater than a 10% disability within a year of exposure to the herbicide. So they would have had to have said something within a year of their exposure. But it's acute, uh, subacute peripheral uh, neuropathy, uh, chlorine chloric acne or other similar acne form disease. Um, they have the atomic veterans exposed to ionizing radiation. Um, a lot of, some of which have only applies to a uh, World War II timeframe, but reading through it, if you serve before February 1st of 1992 at a, a diffusion plant, in Kentucky, uh, Portsmouth, Ohio, or Oak Ridge, Tennessee, you can actually um, get in on this. So something to pay attention to with some of this stuff. Don't think it automatically doesn't apply to you because it just says Agent Orange or it just says, you know, um, like this is with radiation. So you wouldn't think like we'd have any of that today, but apparently we do. So pay attention to the dates. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you know where you are, you know where you aren't. So some of this stuff could apply to you if you served. Um, and then of course the Gulf War and post 9-11 veterans. Um, <clears throat> and it's if you served in Southwest Asia theater of operations, Afghanistan, Israel, Egypt, Turkey, Syria, or Jordan during the Persian Gulf War. Um, I read off some of these earlier, the chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, they do have a lot, um, and here it is, any 
diagnosed or undiagnosed illness that warrants a presumption of service connection as determined by the Secretary of Veteran Affairs. So if enough of us have something and we all served and they know that it was toxic, the Secretary of Affairs can amend this list. So it can change without Congress. Like I said, that it's a first. It's new. Um, so if you served in the Southwest Asia Theater of Operations or in Afghanistan on or after September 19th of 2001, um, geez, they've got, I mean, even malaria is on here. So. Um, well, that's pretty big for a lot of people that have already submitted their claims and are like, oh, you know, like, I've already got my 30%. So a lot of people could pretty much go out there and really get their stuff reevaluated and yes. presumptive they're going to get. Yes, uh, especially, I mean, they could have been turned down. Um, you know, sinusitis, I mean, I, I've seen vets turned down for it years ago. Well, they should be turned down now because of the presumptive list. Um. <laughs> Some vets that have 100% and see this list will not go file because they have 100% and they won't. I would honestly advise a vet who is 100% permanent and total not to, not to submit another claim because that will open yourself up to evaluation by the VA. So it's only permanent and total until you give them the door, you open up the door for them. The exception to the rule that I would make in this case. So you have to be 100% permanent in total for over 10 years in order for your spouse, if something should happen to the service member, for your spouse to be entitled to the, to the pension, which is about half of that disability. Now, a spouse can still get a pension before that 10 years. It's just that the vet has to die of a service-connected disability. So let's say you do get cancer. This presumptive list has come out. You know, you've probably got cancer because you served in that area during that time, but you're 100% permanent in total, but you're not going to survive and your spouse won't get anything. Then yes, I would definitely go back in and I would file and say under, you know, do a presumptive claim and go in and say, because you want, obviously you want your spouse to be able to get something if you pass away. Now, after that 10 year mark of being permanent in total, um, and I hate to put it this way, but you could basically walk in front of a bus and your spouse is gonna get something. So, you know, but before that 10 year mark, you, you, you have to have passed of a service related service connected condition for your spouse to be entitled to the pension, the survivor's pension. So. Thank you for clarifying that. Cause that is something that is not talked about either. No, no, no. And permanent and total is not permanent and total. Yeah. Permanent and total means you're not going to get reevaluated, but if you open the door, the VA may very well walk in and say, well, nope, that got better, you know, so we're going to reduce this or we're going to do this. So you want to be, you do want to be careful and you do want to keep going to your doctor's appointments and you want to keep telling them, you know, hey, this stuff isn't getting better and, you know, keep being seen and, and things like that. But at the same time, you know, you also want to be able to take care of your family, right? If something like that were to happen, I mean, God forbid, but if you're, under that 10 years and you're hundred percent permanent in total. And you're, like I say, you're under that 10 years and you come down with one of these cancers that they've said is presumptive. I mean, at that point, you know, I'd want to file because if something happened to me, I, you know, I'd want my spouse to be able to get that, you know, to have that survivor's pension. So it's not much, but it's better than nothing, I guess you'd say. You know, uh, one one thing I really want to point out to everybody um, is something that happened in particular. You read your VA newsletter. Yeah. You read 
the things that the VA sends to you. The VA sends you information. I know. I get it in there. Don't treat it like junk mail. Open it up. Read it. Digest it. And you never know. You may have complaints about a system that is designed to help us. But if you don't ever do anything about it or become part of the change or fill out one of those surveys, then you're just kind of you're just kind of uh, creating the problem even more. You're making it even worse. So be a part of the solution. And Amy, like, yeah. thanks for being part of that solution. Yeah, yeah. I'm surprised the VA hasn't red flagged me yet. I'm just. <laughs> they even gave you a job. Well, the focus group actually, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a it's a very it's a very small job. But yes, I will be helping analyze the data, um, and uh, help helping to put that together. It's going to take a while, but putting it together to present to VA leadership and hopefully, you know, that can make a that can make a huge difference. Um, you know, when the focus group started, they were like, "Don't worry, your names are not going to be used." And I'm like, "Oh, you can have my name. Just go ahead, throw it out there." Like the rest of the group, I was like, "Here's all my information." I, <laughs> um, no, the idea is that we make it better for all vets, right? Yeah. Make it better for all vets, you know. And and our generation right now, yeah, I, I, we gotta get into these. We got to get into these organizations, these service organizations, and start donating our time to it. Because right now, it's a bunch of Vietnam vets. God love them. They've paved the way. They've made a lot of change. They've done so much. They're a huge group of veterans. If there's a program that's messed up, give it to them. They'll fix it. They'll get it done. They've got the backing. They can, you know, the advocacy, the advocacy, I can't talk. They have the advocates, you know. Uh, to go and you know fight for legislation and and do things like that but our generation needs to step up to because they're not going to be here forever so and we're we're a different service than they were you know there's women that are serving you know they're I mean more women I should say because my aunt actually is a Vietnam vet but um <clears throat> That's, you know, that's, that's rare. So there's more women serving and they're getting out. Um, I mean, there's just, you know, it's just a different, different mindset. We serve during a different time. That's all. Yeah, that's awesome. So before we go into the saved round and alibis, does anybody else have anything else? All right. So we only got one save round and alibi because this is your second time coming on. To right, this. right. <laughs> <laughs> so our saved round and alibi today is, Amy, when you were transitioning out of the military, mm -hmm. how did you get into the right mindset to transition and reintegrate into the community? Wow. I don't think I had time to even have a mindset, to be fair. No, because I mean, my kids were in school, they were small and you know, I just, I had to get a job and I had to get going. I had to put food on the table. So I think that was really, oh my God, the mindset. It's just, I've got to, I've got to put food on the table, I think. I, and that might sound kind of depressing, but that's really how it was. It was like, here's the problem. I need to fix it. So we're going to keep. <laughs> it sounds like a fighting mi mindset, like, uh, like, you know, almost kind of. Fight or flight response. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the veterans that transition out because they're not prepared or because whatever reason, they go into that state. And most of the ones that we've talked to, unfortunately, they don't even realize that they went through a transition or when they went through a transition. Yeah. And it was years after because the first few years, they were just fighting to stay alive, whether it was providing for their food, providing for their VA benefits, providing for whatever else that they could. Mm -hmm. And we've met veterans that have been out of the service for 10, 12 years and just now started to understand that they have been still 
trying to figure out a way to transition out. So it's yeah. it's not new or surprising to hear that. It's surprising to you because this is the first time that you analyze it, but it is more common, unfortunately, than not. Yeah, yeah. a lot of yeah. people realize the transition's happening while you're still in. While yeah. you're still active duty, that's when you start transitioning. Then as soon as day one hits of you getting out, reintegrating is the other part. But what Yogi just said is absolutely right. 10 years later, someone's still transitioning mindset and they're not reintegrated yet. Yeah. You know, something occurred to me the other day, and I guess it was because somebody asked me, how did I get kind of where I am, like with helping veterans with, uh, you know, now it's the focus group. I've come on here twice. I'll probably come on here more. Um I, I'm actually sure that I will, but uh, just send me the invite and I'll come on anytime you guys need. But um, like, how did I get here? And I really sat down and I thought about it. It was anger. It's how I got here. This is what I did with it. I was very angry. I was very angry that the VA had, you know, misdecided my my claim. I was very angry that I had to continually go through surgeries to fix stuff that the military hadn't fixed. I was very angry that when I tried to go to the VA healthcare system, I wasn't, I always felt like I wasn't getting anywhere. I wasn't going anywhere with it. And I think just one day I just, I, I, I woke up and I said, you know what, I'm going to understand this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to figure this out. And then I'm going to tell any veteran that will listen to me about this. So this doesn't happen to them. That's, but that's really where it started. I was, I was just very angry. There's got to be a reason, you know, why they do things this way. So. No, and you turn that anger into a positive thing. You turn yeah. it negative. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I, I would say that you you had a definitely a survivor fighter uh, mindset. So um, our goal is to try to keep people from getting into that mindset. Start people. Yeah. Starting people <laughs> now. So that way, you know, like, hey, yeah, I get it. You still have to go get a job. You still have to put food on the table, but you're doing it in a different mindset. Like, I get to go do that instead of I had to do it. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, it's um, it's one of our one of our biggest things is to pretty much identify that stuff. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and if y'all know any women veterans that would be interested in the focus group or being part of it, let me know. So. As always, thank you, Amy, for coming on the show and keeping up being part of the group and being one of our experts that allows us to bring different resources and you improve on yours and share with the group. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So everybody that's on here, Amy, she covered a lot of stuff. She talked about the PACT Act. She talked about presumptive. Um, she talked about the focus groups and a lot of resources. Check your junk mail. It's stuff that you guys should be doing. And Amy took her negative energy and she's been turning it to something good. And she put out a lot, a lot of great information for those who are going to be transitioning here soon and want to get to their VA stuff. Stay tuned because Amy's episodes that are coming up, we're going to start talking about VA benefits inside of States. So you're going to want to listen to Amy and what she has to say about all the different States. All right, guys, it's your transition take charge of it. It's not all rainbows and unicorns. Mildevet out.
that are <laughs> that are being <laughs> independently funded. I'm gonna kill him. Uh, this, um. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so no, it's being, oh my God. It's hey, being in Yogi, <laughs> you keep it up, you're going to have to do the editing. <laughs> yeah. Why me? I did not even type. That was done, and she cannot even keep a straight face.